Kathy. Alan, I just want to be alone. If it wasn't Dad's birthday... I know. You wouldn't have wanted to come. You haven't been sharing much with me lately, but that you've made abundantly clear. You can't hide from them all day. That's what the only thing you've been doing lately is hiding. Come on inside, please. Let's get some cake. It's Peggy's famous double fudge chocolate cake. I'm not hungry. Oh, fine. If you want to make yourself miserable all day, that's your decision. Aunt Kathy, Uncle Alan, look. Haley let me hold one of the twins. Isn't she super cute? Yes, you are. She is pretty adorable. Which one is this? This is Alyssa. Elena is inside getting her diaper changed. Oh, and guess what? Haley told me that next year when the twins are a little older, Taylor and I can maybe come over and babysit sometimes. Wow. When I'm growing up and married, I'm gonna have tons of kids, like five or six of them. Aunt Leanne said because twins are running in our family, I might end up having twins too, which would be so awesome. How come you guys never have any kids? Don't you like kids, Aunt Kathy? Oh. I mean, how could you not love a pretty little face like this? Oh no, it, it's not, that's not it. Uh, um, she's perfect. I always wanted to have a big family. It's just, well, things don't always turn out the way. Excuse me. What's up with Aunt Kathy? Did I, did I say something wrong? No, Rachel, no, sweetie. It's just that sometimes uh, being around babies makes Aunt Kathy a little sad. Sad? I don't get it. Babies usually make people really happy. Oh, well, the truth is, to answer your question, uh, we did have a baby. What? We did. A boy. Our son. But when he was born, there were some problems. And he only lived a couple of hours. His name was Justin. Oh, wow. That's terrible. I'm really sorry if I upset. No, it's OK. You know, you were, you didn't know. You were young, and the family doesn't talk much. There are a lot of things the family doesn't talk about. Oh, you have no idea. Um, I'm gonna go find Haley or Aaron. I think it's Alyssa's turn for new diaper. I can't do this anymore, Alan. Kath. We need to tell him. Tell them what? That we're filing for divorce. Divorce? You're the only one that wants a divorce. I never agreed to a divorce. You Bradens really have a way of throwing a party. Happy birthday. Oh, and by the way, our marriage is in the tank. Do you really think that if you dig in your heels, I'm going to change my mind? You always change your mind. I've been watching you do the same thing for 10 years. You'll be going along OK, and then someone in our lives has a baby, and you become bitter and resentful again, and you just push me away. Well, and if I'm so difficult, maybe I'm doing you a favor. Why do you think getting a divorce could possibly help you anyways? You're already trying to manage this on your own, even though I'm right here for you. Alan, I don't know what else to do anymore. When, when Justin, when, when it all happened, my entire world fell apart. Since then, nothing has made sense to me. Not us, not, not God. I used to think that if I could just get pregnant again, everything would snap back to normal. Like, everything that was broken would be fixed. But every time I miscarried, it was like my own body was betraying me all over again. I have had to carry all that pain around with me, and the more time goes by, the more it eats away at me. But see how you go around like nothing ever happened. I just can't do this. You think you're the only one this has been painful for? You're not the only one that lost Justin. I think about him every single day. What he would have looked like. What great he would have been. And if I would have been his little league coach. I never knew that you could miss someone so much after only knowing him for two hours. I miss who he would have become. I hurt too, and I have done the best I could to hold myself together through all of it so that I could be strong there for you, but you never let me. I told you a million times, I would have done anything to have fixed this. Oh. If you wanted counseling, we could have done counseling. Oh. If you wanted in vitro, we could have done in vitro. Oh. If you wanted to adopt, we could have adopted. Oh. I 
Every time I suggested anything, you just turned it around into a fight. But, Alan, you just don't understand. Oh, you know what? I get it. It's easier to stay unhappy than it is to fight through the hard stuff. Alan, I'm not the same person you married anymore. Neither am I. Go ahead. Tell them whatever you want. But just don't be confused who the selfish one is. Kathy and uh, Alan display for us that life can really beat us up at times, can it? And you know, sometimes when we get beat up by life, we end up beating up the people that are closest to us. It really is, uh, it's a reality of life, reality of life. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 4. Turn your phones, your Bibles, your iPads, I don't care what you use. I want you to see God's word this morning. Thanks, Chad. Maybe I'll sit on this one, but I can keep that one just in case I need it. Oh, oh my goodness. Luke chapter 4. Uh, if you're newer to the Bible, New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, then John, but the third gospel, third book of the New Testament. Amazing passage. It's one of those passages I've read hundreds of times, then one day when I was reading it, it's like God turned on the lights for me and it knocked me off my seat. I, I pray that'll happen for you this morning. you there in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 says this. Well, let me give you the context. Jesus was in the synagogue, anointed with the Holy Spirit, and he went up to the front and, and grabbed the scrolls and he kind of searched through the book of Isaiah because he was looking for a specific passage to read to those group of people who were gathered together that morning. And that specific passage was a passage about the Messiah and about him bringing the good news to the broken and the needy. Now, as I read this passage, I want you to remember that Jesus was speaking to the church-going people of the time actually call them the synagogue going, but we, we relate more to the church. Th these were the religious people. These were the Mosaic law-abiding citizens who would uh, find themselves regularly at church. And listen as I read, starting in verse 17. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach and you know what I, I want to stop right now because I just feel like the Lord's telling me you know what I've always felt if Jesus needs to be anointed to preach how much more desperately does Pat Peglo need to be anointed to preach so I want to take a moment if you would pray with me um, I'm gonna pray that the Spirit of God would anoint me this morning and let me tell you, on one hand, as Jesus, we see at the start of Luke, needed to be anointed with the Spirit to preach. At the end of Luke, we find these men on the road to Emmaus walking with Jesus, the, the anointed Messiah, opening up the Old Testament, showing them the passages that had to do with him, and they didn't get it until God opened their minds to understand. And so, you know what, as we come together every Sunday morning, we need the Spirit of God to anoint the speaker, whoever it is that morning. We need the Spirit of God to anoint us as listeners, that with our ears we can hear things of the voice of God speaking to us through his word in his sermon that morning. So would you pray with me? Father, thank you. This wasn't planned, uh, but as I read this passage, I'm just impressed by your spirit this morning how desperately I need to be anointed this morning by your Holy Spirit. So, Father, I ask you that he would rest upon me this morning. He would be everything I need. I think of Corinthians, it talks about the gifts of the Spirit. It's a manifestation of the Spirit. Father, I ask this morning that the Holy Spirit would manifest himself through me this morning as I preach. 
And I pray for my brothers and sisters that are listening, Lord, who just as desperately need the Spirit of God to open up their minds to understand. Open up their minds to really get it. Open up their ears to hear the voice of God speaking to them this morning. To open up their eyes to behold wonderful things that they've never seen before, even in texts that maybe they've read a hundred times before. And like Lydia, to open their hearts so that the word of God might go deep within them. So Lord, I pray, I commit this morning to you, and we cry out together asking both for the speaker and those listening this morning that the Spirit of God would have his way with us. He would, he would take control of us, he would, that you would fill us with him, you would anoint us with him, Lord. God, that, that he would just make this morning an eternal experience. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's go on. So here's Jesus. He got the scroll of Isaiah. He looked specifically for a passage, a passage that dealt with the Messiah. And then verse 18, he started to read it, and it said this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set free those who are oppressed to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Jesus read a passage that talked about the Spirit anointing the Messiah to preach to the poor, to the captives, to the blind, to the oppressed. And you know, the question that really hit my mind for so many years as I read this passage is, why is Jesus reading this passage to the churchgoers? <laughs> why is he reading it to the Mosaic law-abiding citizens, uh, probably the, the religious people of the day? Why wasn't Jesus out on the streets reading this passage to the prostitutes and to the thieves and to the beggars and to the, you know, the, the people out on the streets, the, the addicts and reaching out to them with this kind of passage. I've always been struck by that. But listen what he says in the next two verses. Verse 20. And Jesus closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. It's like Jesus went and sat back in the front row, and everybody's kind of looking, and well, what's this all about? Then Jesus said from his seat, began to say to them, today, this scripture, the one that Jesus just read, has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now what Jesus said flew right over their heads. <laughs> they missed it by a mile. And I wonder if it's flying over your head this morning as it flew over my head for so many years. And, and the amazing response in the next verse, verse 22, is they all were speaking well of him and were wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, is this not Joseph's son? They, they, they were talking about what a wonderful message and what a wonderful guy. And this is, this is Joseph's boy. Did you hear what he said today? Wow, the way he read that, that was so powerful. That was so whatever. But what they missed is this. Jesus said, today, this passage is fulfilled in your hearing. Two things had to happen for this passage to be fulfilled that day. The first one was is that Jesus had to be the Messiah, right? This was a passage about the Messiah being anointed to preach. And so the first thing that they didn't recognize Jesus was saying is it's fulfilled right in, this presence. in their presence is the fact that Jesus is saying, I'm the Messiah. But the second piece that they missed, for this passage to be fulfilled in their hearing, Jesus had to be preaching to the poor, to the captives, to the blind, to the oppressed. You see, what they missed, they're spiritually blind. <laughs> they're spiritually poor. They're spiritually captives. 
they're spiritually oppressed. And they missed it totally, and they're just going, hey, what a wonderful guy, what a wonderful message. And it flew right over their heads that Jesus was standing up saying, I'm the Messiah, and you people right here are poor, you people are enslaved as captives, you people are blind to spiritual realities, you're enslaved to sin, you are spiritually poor, you are spiritually oppressed. You see, they would be much like me thinking, well, he's talking about those people out in the streets. Jesus was talking to them. These people were broken. And I love the response here. I shouldn't say I love the response. I'm grateful I don't get this one much. Because as they said back to Jesus, they say, you know, they were talking to one another, say, oh man, this guy's wonderful. What a wonderful message. Then Jesus started to talk to them a little bit further about his ministry and them. And down in verse 28, listen to their response. This is by the time they left. This is when he first started. It's continued on. It said in verse 20, and all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. And they got up and drove him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. I am so grateful you've restrained yourselves on Sunday mornings and you have not gone this far with your responses. But I have to be honest with you, I'm equally concerned about the responses that fly right over our heads. <laughs> Where we end up just like these church-going, synagogue-going, law-abiding citizens who are good people and when we hear a message, it flies right over our head, and we go out in what Howard Hendricks used to call the glorifying the worm ceremony. That's after the service, you go up to the pastor and say, oh, what a great message today, pastor. That's what they call the glorifying the worm ceremony. And you go back and say, oh, what a good message today, and let's go get some donuts and coffee. And by the way, we better get home before noon because kickoff is at noon. That's kind of how these guys responded. They missed it. You see, if we catch the message, we should be all on our faces up here saying, God, have mercy on me. I'm spiritually poor. I'm spiritually a captive to my own sins and to the work of Satan in my life. And, and God, I, I, I'm spiritually blind and there's so much that I don't get and see. And, and Jesus I'm oppressed constantly of, by life and by the devil and by my flesh and by this world and by my own sin. You see, if we really got it, we wouldn't be rushing out to our coffee and saying, good job today, Pat, good message, you got the text right. Getting our donuts and running home to the bears. We'd be running to Jesus saying, God, have mercy on me. Lord, I need you. Or... Another appropriate response would be to get a posse together and get Pastor Pat, take him to the top of the building and throw him down. I mean, at least we know you got the message then. <laughs> you follow me? But non-response is not a response to God's word. We just walk, oh yeah, that was a good message today. Oh yeah, that was good. Give me another donut. Especially those donut holes, I like those. Another coffee. Hurry up, babe, we gotta get home to the Bears game. You see what I'm saying, guys? The word of God when we catch it, and when the Spirit of God opens our eyes, demands a response. And it demands either a falling of our face before God for mercy, or even a reaction against God. He wonder say, now what in the world does this have to do with a relationship series? I think that's a very fair question at this point. You might say, did Pat forget we're doing a series on relationships? Well, my point today is very simple. Our relationships are not as they were intended to be. Because we're not as we were intended to be. We're all broken. And because we're all broken, we're in relationships with broken people Therefore, our relationships are broken and much more complex and complicated than we would ever dream to be. 
And I'll tell you what, there's one thing worse than being in a relationship with a broken person, because we're all broken, is being in a relationship with a person that doesn't see their brokenness. You follow what I'm saying? They kind of feel they're okay and everybody else is the problem. And they don't recognize that both of us walk into this relationship, we're both broken and we're both struggling. Proverbs 14, we looked at this early on in the series, said wisdom rests in the heart of the one who has understanding. The sooner and the better we understand that we are broken, that I'm broken, that you're broken, that we're all broken, the wiser we're going to be in our relationships. Not only will we be wiser, I think the more grace we'll give to one another and even to ourselves with our own brokenness. So here, here's the question. Are we really broken? Come on, Pat. Everybody's basically pretty good people. You know, there's a couple of real bad people out there. But for the most part, we're, we're all good people. Are we really broken? Well, let me start by defining brokenness and then kind of showing you what the Bible says about this. First of all, brokenness can be defined in two ways. The first way is the fact that's true of every one of us that we are all broken broken. We are not operating the way we were designed to or intended to operate. It's kind of like having an uh, electronic instrument or a car that looks real good on the outside, but it's broken <laughs> and it's not working. And it's just not the way it was created to be. It's not what it was intended to do and it's just not operating right. See, that's what brokenness is. What, what I'm saying this morning, and we're going to see from the Word of God in a few minutes, is that we're all broken. None of us are operating the way we were created to operate or were intended by God to operate. That's what brokenness is. And that's a fact that's true of every one of us. But the second definition or the second way that brokenness is used is it's not true of everybody, but it's only true of those who God gives grace to by his spirit to open their eyes. And that's to say and to see that I am broken. <laughs> to recognize deep down inside that there's something wrong with me. <laughs> there's something broken. I'm not the way I was intended to be. I'm damaged material. And that kind of brokenness produces a humility and dependence that is very sweet before the Lord. Because all of a sudden I recognize, man, we're all in this thing together. We're all struggling. We're all wrestling in this battle. And you know what? My only hope is in Jesus Christ and his spirit to give me what I need to walk through every day, every relationship, and through this life. That's what brokenness is. Brokenness is a fact, but the grace of seeing our brokenness is a reality that not everybody has experienced, but my prayer today is that many more of you for the first time today might experience the grace of seeing how broken you really are. <laughs> kind of sound like, man, I came to church for this. Tell me how damaged I am, how broken I am, how I'm not operating well. But yeah, that's what we came to church for today because it's the truth. And when we face the truth, we can live in life a lot better. We give other people a lot more grace and a lot more room as we walk with them. So let me give you a little biblical overview of the reality of our brokenness. It all started, Adam and Eve were created in God's image, two perfect people in a perfect relationship relating with God perfectly and relating with each other perfectly. But Satan deceived them and he got them to drink the poison of sin and when they drank the poison it broke something inside. Something started to rot away. Their life and their relationship started to be destroyed and every area of their life was touched. When you hear the word depravity, that's a theological term, that the man is depraved. 
uh, the depravity, the total depravity of man. That doesn't mean man is as totally as bad as possible. We see there's a lot of good people in the world. We can't deny that. That's not what total depravity means, is that we're as bad as we can possibly be, be, as bad as we can possibly be. Total depravity means that the total part of my life, of my being, has been touched by sin, and every area of my being has been affected by sin. I don't think the way I was intended or created to think because I've been touched by sin. I don't feel the way that I'm supposed to feel because my emotions have been touched by sin. My body doesn't act the way that my body's supposed to act because I've been touched by sin. My will doesn't make choices the way I was intended and designed to make choices because of sin. My affections are not set where they're supposed to be because I've been affected by sin. My desires, my sexuality, on and on and on are not as bad as they can possibly be but they're not as as they were intended to be because they were touched by sin. And ever since Adam and Eve, every child that was born, every person in this room can trace their ancestry back to Adam and Eve eventually. We've been born in their image. And what that is is the image of God, but marred. You see, Adam and Eve were born in the image of God and was perfect. Sin came in and has marred them in who they are. And so now we are created in God's image as well, like our parents. But we also have, like our parents, Adam and Eve, we've been touched by sin. And so we are born marred. We're not right. It's not the way it was designed to be. So the reality, and the Bible teaches this, that every person is born damaged. Every person is born damaged. We're born broke. We don't have to wait until we do things later on. (laughs) We're born broken and damaged. Not able to operate as God originally intended. My wife was telling me just about, you know, she watches our our grandchildren on different days. A couple weeks ago, so cute that she was talking to our oldest granddaughter, Calissa, and just saying something to her, just real nice and sweet, and Calissa just stuck out her tongue at her. Like, well, where'd that come from? Well, you know what? They really are born broken. <laughs> we, we don't see that when we pick them up in the nursery. <laughs> they don't operate as intended, but as we get older, we begin to see it's not all happening the way that we kind of dreamed or thought by the book it was going to happen. I'm going to let you in on a secret. Don't abuse me with this. I would never abuse you with information I have. How about it, Gary? Absolutely. You know that for a fact. As Gary says, no good deed goes unpunished by me. So, uh, you know, I'm one of those kind of guys. But you know what? I love when we go in the store. My wife wants to go buy a piece of furniture. I want to start in that section in the back of the store where the stuff is returned because it's got a scratch on it. You know what I mean? We have that department that says uh, uh, purchase as is, no returns. And so uh, the reason I go there is because obviously the price is right there, you know, and so whatever, you know. And so my wife's got a little more class. She wants to start in the other area where it's a little bit nicer. But you know, the reality is this. We got to recognize that even when we go to the nursery and the hospital to pick up our babies, We're going to that area that says you're getting it as is. No returns. They're already damaged. They're already broken. And as time goes on, and opportunities go on, and life goes on, that brokenness and damage becomes more and more clear. We really are all broken. We've been broken since birth. And we've been born into a world that's a war zone. I'm talking, you know, if you don't believe the Bible, you can say, this guy's nuts this morning, okay? And I understand that. But I'm just telling you what the Bible says. We were born into and live in a war zone. We're in a DMZ zone. We're in a war zone. We're in the God of this world is Satan. 
And he is using the world that he is the God of like putty. You can kind of take it and squeeze it and, and make it and mold it anything you want it into, right? Well, that's what the world is seeking to do with us, with Satan at the controls as the God of this world. He's trying to squeeze and press and change us to be like the philosophies and the values and the ways of this world. And then we got a flesh that, that, that is attracted to the things that the world offers. And, and all the positions and all the pleasures and all the possessions that this world is offering, and Satan's kind of holding that carrot down in front of us, and my flesh says, I want that, I want that, I want that. And when we bite that carrot, <laughs> We drink the poison, we drink the Kool-Aid, and guess what happens? We add to our brokenness. We add to the damage in our lives. We find that ourselves are getting more and more complex and more and more damaged. Listen to what Ezekiel 33 says. Surely our transgressions and our sins are upon us, and we are rotting away in them. How then can we survive? Rotting away. That's what sin does. It rots us away. I'm not as I was intended to be. I'm not that fresh fruit that God designed me to be. I'm rotting away because of my sins and the personal times. He's, uh, Galatians 6, 7 says this, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. Many of us as believers today, whether they were sins we committed before we knew Jesus or afterwards, are living with the consequences of those sins. <laughs> and, and now our life has become that much more complicated. Our relationships have become that much more complicated. We become that much more complicated. We become that much more broken because sin is rotting us. We, first of all, we were born damaged and broken as we begin to personally engage into sin in this world, we begin to rot ourselves away even more and we begin to add consequences to our life that we're trying to sort out that is making our life and relationships more complex. Then add to this. We live in a world and a life that can just beat us up. Life can just beat us up. Jesus said this. These things I've spoken to you so that you may have peace. In the world, you have tribulation. That's a fact. In the world, you have tribulation. And life comes upon us. But take courage. I've overcome the world. You know, the reality is, and I'm one of them, we now live life with a limp because we've been beat up by life, or some of us beat up by our sins. Like Kathy and Alan in the sketch today, some of us got emotional limps, some of us have got sexual limps, some of us have got physical limps, some of us have got mental limps, some of us have personalities that now we walk with a limp through life with. I think especially of those who have been sexually abused you know what, they didn't eat. They're, they're victims of somebody else's sin, but now they're walking with a limp, not living as they were intended to live because of somebody else's sin against them. Guys, we live in a world that can beat us up. And many of us are walking with a limp, and your pastor's one of them. For many of it, you know, I, as I tell people, most of my troubles are self-created. <laughs> I did most of them before I knew Jesus with consequences that I'm carrying for the rest of my life. Uh, but uh, many of the things that happen to me, I can't blame others. It really has to do with me, and I'm limping because of it. We find ourselves afflicted in many different ways. The stresses of life in the world come upon us, things that are beyond our control. We find ourselves in circumstances that are bigger than we're smart, so we're perplexed. We don't know what to do. We're not quite sure the answer to all the questions. Some of us have been persecuted for being Christians or taking a stand for righteousness. Others have just been struck down because the blows of life are like a knockout punch that come upon them. And then you add to all this, just this is my last point, weaknesses. We all have weaknesses. 
just areas of our life we don't operate too well. <laughs> it, it just isn't put together well. We have different weaknesses. We have multiple weaknesses. And so when you put all this stuff together, what I said, I come back to what, what's all this, what does Luke 4 and all this have to do with relationships? This is what it has to do. I think I have it in a PowerPoint. We really are broken, damaged people. In relationships with broken, damaged people, therefore our relationships are broken, damaged, and complex. That's reality. You know, this isn't the kind, you know, I totally started this series. My, my commitment was to present to you what the Word of God has to say about our relationships, not like if you're just going to a, you know, a happy weekend where you're going to hear just a lot of stuff that make us feel good, because, and I think those things are important and helpful. My commitment as a pastor is to teach you the truth of what God's Word says so you can put that into building your life around with the understanding of the truth that God has revealed to us. We are all broken people, broken by various different means. In relationships of broken people, therefore we're in broken relationships that are very complex and complicated. So what do we do about this? Simply, I think that there's uh, two things we need to ask God for to start with. And number one is that these truths would not just fly over our heads like they flew over the heads of those people Jesus was reading to, the good church-going, law-abiding citizens that heard that and thought, well, he's talking about somebody else. Or he's talking about the people out in the streets, not me. One of the greatest gifts we could receive this morning is that the Spirit of God would open my eyes to see God I'm the one Jesus was talking about. I'm the one Pastor Pat was talking about today. To recognize the depth of our own brokenness. And the second thing is, is when we recognize that, there seems to be a new grace that God gives to be merciful and understanding both to ourselves and to other people other people's brokenness, other people's damages. And when it touches our life and affects us, there, there's a new room, there's a, there's a new space to be able to say, you know what, I get it. <laughs> you know what, we all hurt and disappoint one another. I hurt you, you hurt me. I disappoint you, you disappoint me. That's reality of relationships. That's got to be a place, when we go in there with expectations that everybody's going to treat me right and be good to me and love me right all the time, you just get frustrated over and over and over again. But when you recognize that people are broken, I'm broken, we hurt one another, we disappoint one another, there's real hope for grace and mercy in our relationships. So as we need move to communion this morning, Ushers, if you would get in place. You need to remember these words from Jesus. Blessed are the poor in spirit. <laughs> it's a blessing to recognize the poverty, our blindness, our captivity, our brokenness, our... That is a blessing, according to Jesus. Because it's going to produce something in us that we get no other way. Let me say it this way. We've all been born damaged. But there's one exception to the rule. <laughs> Who's the exception? Jesus. The only one who was ever born damaged not broken or damaged by sin. The rest of us are in a different category. <laughs> Jesus is separate from the rest. That's what holy means. Separate, set aside. And we are unholy. We're common. That's what it means. We're just like the rest of the group. We're all in this thing together. We're all sinners. We're all damaged. We're all broken. We're common. He's uncommon. He is unique. 
Jesus is perfect, never damaged in his mind by sin, never damaged in his emotion, never damaged in his relationships, never damaged in his affections, never damaged in his desires. You follow me? Every part and piece, corner and cranny of Jesus is perfect. He is fully righteous. He's fully God. And there's some of us today as we come to communion this morning that don't know Jesus personally. And as we go to communion, you know, communion is for believers. And if you're here today and you've never come to the place to recognize the depth of your own brokenness before God, of your spiritual poverty, that I just don't have enough to be pleasing to God, I just don't have enough to be acceptable to God. I just don't have enough to come into a relationship with God and the Father because what's enough? Enough is being as good as Jesus. As we said this morning, none of us are there. We're all broken and damaged. My hope, your hope, and when I came to the recognition of the depth of my brokenness and damage because of sin, it drove me to my knees. Jesus, you're my only hope. Because what God offers as a gift, as Jesus went to the cross to pay the price of my sin, so the penalty be taken out of the way. He rose from the dead, sent it back into heaven, sent the Holy Spirit to live inside of me as a gift to begin to work in me, to begin to repair some of the damage. And so that Pat's not as damaged as he used to be. Still damaged, but you know what? Becoming a little bit more like Jesus every day as the Spirit of God works in me. And that's the gift he offers to you this morning. To pay, that Jesus paid the penalty for your sin, offers for the Spirit of Christ to come live inside of you, to begin to be like a dam, to put some of the stop to the damage, begin to give you wisdom on how to walk with it, begin to work in you, to begin correcting some of the damage and the junk in our lives, it's a process that will continue to the day we're with Jesus. But it's all ours if we'd be willing to bow before Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm broken. <laughs> I'm not as you intended me to be. That's what sin is. Falling short of God's holy, righteous standard. And when we will fall on our faces before God and acknowledge that and grab on with the two hands of our heart and soul to the cross of Jesus, say, Jesus, you are my only hope. <laughs> At that moment, God says he will forgive our sins and he will send the Holy Spirit to live inside of us to begin a work in us. So if you're here this morning, as the plate goes by and you don't know Jesus, let the plate go by and take that time to call out to Jesus to save you. And if you're a believer here this morning, I think it's a beautiful opportunity just to thank God that even while we were enemies, Christ died for us. God loves us at our worst. Not at our best, at our worst. When we were helpless and couldn't help ourselves, Jesus died for the ungodly. You know, as believers this morning, the greatest thing you could do is say, God, you know what? I am, I'm all that stuff and worse. Thank you, God, for loving me. Thank you, Jesus, for dying in my place. Can we pass the elements?
dismissed. Chad, Chad, you're usually up there leading us. You don't get a chance to pray for us too often with the bread. Would you do that, good brother? God, uh, thank you so much, uh, Lord, for the way that you put yourself on that cross. Um, Father, reminded of what it says in Revelations, that we're called to come and buy things that would help us to see the reality of who we are. Uh, Lord, that was your your um, yes. your word to the church in Laodicea. God, I, I know that's your word to us today. Uh, Father, would you help us to see ourselves in the way that we are? Uh, God, would that drive us to be gracious to each other? Uh, Lord, as we remember what you've done for us, uh, Father, would you help us to, uh, Lord, remember that all of us, each individually, are broken, <clears throat> and that, God, we need your grace and your mercy to make our relationships uh, Father, whole and pleasing to you. Uh, God, thanks for what you did in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Chad. Let's eat the bread together. I'm going to speak off my microphone, set that over there for a second. You know, recognizing the depth of our spiritual poverty, captivity, blindness, and oppression is a good thing if it drives us to Jesus. Unfortunately, some people are the nature, it's a very fleshly response, they think it's good, but they beat themselves up with it. <laughs> I'm really a bad guy, and I'm really this and that. This, this isn't what this is about today. It's not what Jesus' words were about. They were driving us to the feet of Jesus. <laughs> Receive mercy and grace, help at the time of need. No, I, some, I've said this before, and you'll probably hear it a lot more because it's become very meaningful to me recently. But when you see the depth of your brokenness, 